Okay, all right, welcome everyone to the last talk of this first session. Um, after this talk, there will be a brief delay, a little a little 30 minute break, and then we'll come back for a second session later in the afternoon. But for now, I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, Eustace, who will, uh, yeah, who I'll just leave to start talking. All right, take it away, Eustace, thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Justus. I'm a current PhD student at the Dundas Institute in the Netherlands. And today I would like to show you some of the work I did with the uh, Spike Friends project, which is part of the Human Brain Project, uh, with the title Training Spiking Neural Networks for Continuous Control with Surrogate Gradients. And um, before I get started with my own work, I want a quick, uh, quick look on some previous work. Um, there has been obviously a lot of work in spiking neural networks um, that I cannot possibly review in this presentation all at once, but I just wanted to highlight that in the recent past, there has been a higher concentration of works on spiking neural networks for continuous control problems, robotic control problems, and uh, I fit with my work into this domain, and I want to highlight specifically three different works that have been able to um, enable my work quite uh, strongly in the last two years, and also this project that is surrogate gradient learning and spiking networks, um, taking lessons from deep learning as well, and then uh, the fluctuation-driven initialization from, uh, from Friedemann's lab. Um, but we want to move. There has been a lot of history um, for classification tasks in spiking neural networks, specifically this one uh, task we all no and love over here on the right has been investigated quite extensively. And when, to, when we want to move um, to continuous control, we need to ask the questions, what are the similarities? What are the differences between these two um, domains? And what are the things we can learn from classification and take them with us to continuous control? For example, one of the state of the arts methods that we use uh, for classification in SNNs is the um, time to first spike encoding, or for example, the uh, max over time readout of these um, non-spiking readout units. And um, in the domain of continuous control, these become quite meaningless and we need to think about other methods on how to input and output into the networks. Um, now I want to briefly talk about control in robotics. If we understand robotics as some dynamic system with you know, some stat dynamics and some control dynamics, um, that we can uh, have fully described. And um, then we can also have some cost function where we you know, parameterize how bad is it to be in a certain state and how bad or expensive is it to apply some certain control. Um, when we have all these components, we can use um, something like a closed loop controller, for example, a PID controller um, to fully um, up to like uh, to control this the system with some when we have some some target state that we want to be in. Um, we can also instead use something uh, like a model where we try to um, model these this change without knowing the explicit uh, matrices A and B here um, with some parameterized function and uh, use this model in uh, in a predictive manner. For example, for model predictive control in order to evaluate hypothetical actions with a cost function and then use them on the system. In this particular work, I would like to um, show you that we can combine um, the forward model as well as a learned controller in, uh, and learn them end to end. Control within SNNs in the past, um, as I said, when we have the full description of a system, we can use a closed form solution um, to come up with um, a controller that can apply some arbitrary control to, to a dynamic system, such as a robot arm. And, um, or we can, for example, use this model predictive based um, approach where we have just a predictive model and unroll um, into the future and um, evaluate what states we would get given some input. Um, and this is essentially what has been done in the recent past. And uh, in, in our work, we try to build on top of that by um, Assuming not that the system is fully described and given, we have to um, use interaction with the robot arm to learn the dynamics, and then we can learn them in a predictive model as well as learn a um, policy from scratch. And I would like to show you now how we um, set this network structure up. Given some arbitrary robot here on the right, 
uh, we take the robot state, a target position of the end effector, and generate a control signal that moves the robot so that the end effector is in the appropriate position. Um, we call this part of the network the policy network, or the inverse model in terms of um, people coming more from the control theory background. And um, on top of here, we have a prediction network or forward model, um, to, given the control signal and the robot state can predict the next state. And what we can then do is we can use um, this state prediction in, and plug it back in as the robot state um, during learning to do some autoregressive uh, prediction loop here. And uh, I will show you in a second on how that is beneficial. Um, since this is a spiking network, we, of course, uh, all these uh, units in here are leaky integrate and fire uh, models that have some um, linear transformation, double exponential temporal filtering, and um, a non-differentiable spike activation function, step activation function. <clears throat> and um, what we use is uh, we use a specific readout population layer to uh, go from you know noisy spiking neurons to smooth continuous uh, variables to read out of the network. The challenges we need to address um, is indeed these noisy readouts. I already just told you now how we do address them. We need to enable the end-to-end -end learning. We need to cope with the fact that obtaining um, Training data might be expensive for real robots, so we want to find ways to overcome that. We want to cope with vanishing gradients. We want to initialize these recurrent networks in a way that we don't have runaway excitation or um, essentially too much inhibition and no activity that propagates through time or space. Um, we need to cope with the fact that we have a large number of parameters in these networks. We might have some neurons dying over the course of training. And um, I'm going to now try to see what we can use from the classification domain and apply it in this uh, control domain. And the task we use to just evaluate these problems in this talk is just this very simple two-link arm you can see on the right here that tries to uh, move towards either moving or stationary targets by uh, having the two joint accelerations set by the control network. When we train the transition network, the loss function is rather simple. We just compare the state prediction with the um, with the actual next observed robot state to obtain this um, state prediction error that we can then back propagate through time through this um, through this network, and we only update the parameters of this transition model with this loss. And um, now, if we look at how to train the policy, we can now use the um, transition network to unroll um, through both time and the transition network. And what we compare here is, indeed, we compare again the state prediction, but now this time we um, use a mask to the state prediction and um, compare it to the target, of, for example, of the end effector state, so that we can get a prediction error that we then want to get the gradient with respect to the control signal, or rather the parameters of the, the prediction model, uh, the policy model that came up with the control signal. So we unroll through time and space um, in this a bit more involved uh, graph over here, but this allows us indeed to use imagined trajectories with the prediction model for learning, and we can use less interaction with the real environment as soon as we have found a prediction model that works relatively well. Now, I wanna quickly show you the performance of our model. Um, the forward model, the prediction model, learns learns the task quite uh, quite quickly and can unroll these um, these state predictions in an ultra regressive uh, manner over time here, um, and stay quite uh, close to the to the ground truth when given some trajectory of actions. Inside the network, when we look at the um, the recurrent first layer over here, we see some spiking activity in in the Next layer, we have way less activity. This is not due to the way the network is initialized. Initially, we see about a similar distribution, but um, this reduces a lot over time since this network just needs to predict the, the change in state from one time step to the next. The, this output is actually quite sparse. And uh, yeah, this would be an example of the continuous decoded um, signal that we read out from the network. For the policy model, um, we can uh, learn this reach and follow task over here. 
Um, yeah, as I showed you before, the, the loss goes down, what is called here reward. Please don't get this confused. We're not doing reinforcement learning. Um, but this you can interpret as uh, how well is the um, network doing the task. And uh, same story here. Here, since this network is not recurrent, we don't see the sparseness effect in this second layer. Um, since here, there's no change in action being predicted, but the actual action itself. Um, now we want to quickly evaluate how did we get these results. In the end, it's it is using it is doing the task, but um, it's not obvious on on how how we got there. Um, and the first question is how do we enable the end-to-end -end supervised learning in the spiking model? And for that, we use the um, surrogate gradient approach, where we replace this um, non-differentiable step activation function here with a smoother version of itself, for which we can get this gradient over here. And as candidate functions, we evaluated uh, several different ones. And today, I'm going to show you the difference between this um, um, multiple Gaussians that are overlaid over one another, the sigmoid activation function and the super spike activation function, and um, different steepness parameters with respect to the gradient. And what we can see um, is that, indeed, the choice of function itself, but primarily the steepness parameter have a large effect on the gradient that we observe in the policy model during learning when unrolling the network over long periods of time. And um, what we can see in the performance of learning is that there is a sweet spot in how large these gradients should be in order to um, obtain a stable learning experience. Um, scaling the um, learning rate with two small gradients, unfortunately, does not necessarily rescue this. This has to be scaled appropriately. So we can't just compensate by using a larger learning rate with smaller gradients. Um, yeah. So the gradients enable backpropagation through time in these networks. The functions generally work, but the, the gradient scale is really rather important. Um, how do we prevent vanishing gradients over time? As we unroll these networks for, for a couple hundred time steps sometimes, um, we can see that um, when we look at the postsynaptic potential that is evoked in any neuron given some input spike, um, we would like to say um, that some transient activity remains in the network so that the gradients can, um, information can can be ported backwards through time uh, effectively. And um, by tuning these, these parameters, the membrane time constant and the synaptic time constant, we can either get a, a sharp response or a flattened response. And we can also get um, control the area under this curve, so to say. And we can again see that um, the gradient is quite dependent specifically on the uh, size of this tau membrane um, constant. And um, once again, there is a sweet spot on having a somewhat large, but not too large, um, membrane time constant of 50 milliseconds that we found here in this particular task and a synaptic time constant that is really rather fast. Um, so having the synaptic time constants lower um, drastically decreases performance. So we want small synaptic constants to facilitate fast reactions to the inputs, but we want uh, large membrane time constants to rescue the vanishing gradients in the network. How to initialize the stable recurrent neural networks? This is a, a question that um, I answered by using the fluctuation-driven initialization regime from which I uh, took a a picture here from from the respective paper and what is done here is given some some input time uh, some input spike raster uh, spike density rather in consideration of the um, PSP kernel so taking these parameters into account how do we need to initialize the weights in order to get a certain um, activity pattern or rather um, the distribution of membrane potential between the resting state and the threshold and we can do so by taking these, um, this input firing rate nu here. Um, in the learning offline case, we can of course obtain this from any data set a priori, but we cannot really do this when the target distribution is moving along with training. And we find that the um, um, performance of, of the network models is for, for some sigmas is really robust. So for some differences between these, uh, the resting potential, the threshold, 
uh, we find some um, where it works really well, but changing the, the this distribution just ever so slightly, even a factor of two or even less, can really, really ruin the performance. So um, while the authors of the original paper in the classification case reported that there's quite some robustness to, towards these parameters, this is not indeed what we find in our case for the recurrent control domain. Um, finally, I want to talk about how to cope with large networks. Having in each layer a couple thousand neurons sometimes um, will lead to very large matrices for feed forward and feedback connections. And what we can do is we can learn from, um, try to learn from the information encoding schemes we see in the brain by restraining the dimensionality of the latent space that these neurons are allowed to project into. Um, quite drastically. And we can do so just by using some matrix factorization where we um, use um, replace a forward weight matrix by two much smaller ones. And uh, by doing so, we can save parameters. But we also see that um, networks with uh, smaller layers um, and constrained latent spaces, they learn faster and they can also uh, sometimes even outperform the full networks on the same task. So um there's once again a sweet spot on um how large we want to have this dimensionality of the latent space in order to enable fast learning and also save parameters on our uh, ram and disk and gpus and wherever we do the training so we can enforce low dimensional dynamics from weight matrix factorization we can save weights by up to 100x and it even helps the learning what did we learn today? There was a lot of different points that I went into because there is not one single silver bullet that enables um, deep learning in these networks for continuous control. We obtained expensive training data by imagined training trajectories with a prediction model. We cope with noisy readouts with a population-based decoding approach. We enabled end-to-end -end learning with surrogate gradients and backpropagation through time. We coped with the vanishing gradients over time by tuning gradient steepness and using the, the time constants. Um, we found um, a somewhat fitting but not very stable uh, fluctuation-driven initialization method from literature. And um, we coped with a large number of parameters in our networks by constraining the um, latent manifold quite drastically. All of this requires careful hyperparameter tuning um, some of the choices we can make a priori are okay, but the take home message here is really that this is a very fragile system and changing one of these schemes in any meaningful way will lead to drastically different results. So um, trying to find robust methods is uh, what we would like to do in the future. Um, I'm currently working on porting this to the um, multi-degree of freedom robot arm that was part of the human brain project and I'll uh, hope to have this written up by the end of the year. And uh, after that, I would like to move towards more interesting tasks rather than just reaching by building on top of the low-level controller with a reinforcement learning architecture. Um, and if you have any uh, ideas or questions about that, please feel free to get in touch. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you for the organizers, and also thank you very much for my lab. Um, the code for this project is all available on uh, on GitHub, and you can uh, write me an email at any time. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Justus. Um, that was a great talk. Very interesting. Um, we're a little over time, but I think we've got a time for oh. a couple of questions. Sorry about that. That's no fine. That's fine. Um, so the first one that seems to be on the top of the list is one from me, which is a sort of general question. What does using SNNs buy you here? Could you have done it with ANNs instead of SNNs? Yes, uh, good question. So um, we have in our lab, um, and also in this in the Spike Friends project that I'm just a small part of. Um, there's uh, another part of it is neuromorphics, and I personally am not um, involved in porting my algorithm onto a neuromorphic chip at this point in time. But uh, in our department, we are very much interested in doing so in the future. So. Um, in that regard, we are looking in, on how we can learn spiking networks um, to then port to chips or also learn directly on some chips. Cool. Yeah, very good. 
Um, so uh, Emre asks, uh, you assumed a linear dynamical system, would it generalize to nonlinear systems? Yes. Um, yeah, we do um, make the assumption that in the small um, time step that we do, we can use a linear approximation for a lot of these um, nonlinear systems. And it seems to work reasonably well as it does for, for some you know, solvers that we use in optimal control. But um, how well it scales and how far we can um, go with this assumption is uh, a question I cannot answer at this point. But I do believe that perhaps the uh, um, recurrence spiking network can also learn some nonlinear dynamics that go beyond the linear approximation we assume. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so next question is, um, where does the, and I'm quite curious about this, where does the bursty activity that we saw in the first layer come from? That was, I think, from one of your earlier slides. Yes, I think um, there are two different networks, right? I'm guessing. Yeah, I, think this is first, I think it was before we got to this slide. That would be this. Yeah, it was this one, I think, that they were referring to. Um, yeah, so the this is um, over 1,600 time steps or 1,800. I'm not quite sure right now. And this is, uh, I think, four seconds of of this robot arm moving that is uh, in, in this data. And initially, the networks are having some initial state that might not represent very well what the, um, the network uh, thinks it should um, fire as, given, given the state of the robot. So there's always a little warm-up period where right. um, the network has to get from, from its initialization state to now I think I represent the activity fairly as this is uh, sort of predicting the change in state over time. Also, as this is a moving target, um, there are more changes over time happening here um, than there are in the second part of this period where you know, the controller might have already reached, um, reached to the target and is then the state of this arm is now not changing as much anymore. So there's gonna be a bit less um, changes to encode. Cool. Okay, well, I think we probably should uh, leave it there because um, we need to give people time to have a little cup of coffee and, yeah. uh, and, and whatever. Um, so, yeah, so thank you very much again, Yusus. Thank uh, you. To everyone else, uh, please come back in about 25 minutes for the next session. Um, if you uh, don't need to go and get yourself a coffee, A copy and we've uploaded it to our YouTube channel and I just put the link in the chat for that. So if you want to catch that, um, now would be a good time to do that. Um, otherwise, I will see you all in about 25 minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.